Hello and welcome to Disrupt TV. Here's a look in our green room. We'd like to introduce our guests in reverse order. My name is Vala Afshar. My co-host is Dan Hinchcliffe and our amazing producer, Elle. And so we'll start with uh, Sheena. Sheena, welcome to Disrupt TV. What are, gonna be, what are we going to be talking about today? Hi, my name is Sheena Iyengar and we're going to be talking about Think Bigger. Excellent. Your new book. Congratulations. Yeah, Looking forward you. to learning. Pat, welcome. Thank you. What are we going to be talking about today, Pat? Uh, we're going to be covering conversational AI. I know uh, ChatGPT is all the rage, so we're going to talk a little bit more about ChatGPT mm -hmm. and, and particularly how these things really fit inside the enterprise and help employees and organizations be more productive. Excellent. Hot topic. All right, Al, let's start the show. All right. Three, two, one. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Dion, myself, and our guest your questions live, and we'll do our best to answer them in the next hour. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host, Dion Hinchcliffe. Hi. Dion is an internationally recognized business strategist, enterprise architect, transformation consultant, futures analyst, and in-demand keynote speaker. Dion is widely regarded as one of the most influential figures in customer experience, digital workplace, technology strategy, and enterprise IT. In fact, Dion was ranked number two influencer in the world in the subject of digital transformation. He's currently the Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, where he heads up the research on global client advisory into CIO issues, the future of work and emerging technologies in enterprise, Dion's thought leaderships can be found on ZDNet, Constellation Research, on digital strategy, and enterprise irregulars. Welcome back, Dion, to Disrupt TV. Great to be here, Vala. That's a fantastic introduction. Uh, I can't wait uh, to get dive into the conversations today, so it's going to be a good one. We have the best and brightest CEOs, fortunately, coming to Disrupt TV, and there's no exception with our first guest, Pat Calhoun, CEO of Espressive, a pioneering AI for enterprise service management. Pat is a visionary leader with an intense focus on user experience and customer adoption. Pat has founded two companies, Airspace and Espressive. Espressive enables uh, frictionless self-help in a work from anywhere world with support for over 100 plus languages, 15 departments, billions of phrases. In fact, on average, they're producing 70%, 74% resolution rate achievements. As CEO, Pat and his team are set to transform the enterprise self-service experience to a consumer-like approach that drives employee adoption and significantly reduces help desk calls, which every business is looking to do right now. Follow Pat on Twitter at Calhoun underscore Pat. Welcome, Pat, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, sir. So, Pat, um, walk us through. Uh, the, you know, conversational AI is all the rage again. Chat GPT was the shot heard around the world last November. Uh, now, all the big hyperscalers now have, have responded in their in kind with. Their, their answers to what they think AI in the enterprise is going to be. Uh, why don't you walk us through your viewpoint, you know, conversational AI, chat GPT, the, the, you know, the, the whole trend. Where is it, where is it going? Yeah. Um, so there's, there, there's a couple different tracks that this can actually take. Um, so first and foremost, you know, the way, the way that I've been looking at conversational AI for the past seven years, which certainly has evolved a lot with the introduction of chat GPT is, is really to help, employees get answers to questions. And one of the things that we actually found um, 
about six, five, you know, six, seven years ago, is that in many cases, employees don't really know what they're looking for. So they're, they, they're, the reason why they want to talk to a human is they want to talk to somebody who can understand them and ask the right questions so they can get to the right answer. And that's why conversational, the conversational component of AI is so important, is to be able to engage employees, make sure that it understands what the employee is actually asking before it just starts throwing out random responses. The thing that I found really interesting about ChatGPT when it came out back in, back in November is that it had the ability to ask further questions. Right. So if you asked something and it wasn't quite sure what you what you were looking for, or perhaps it could go in multiple different directions. Chad GPT did have that conversational angle to it, which which was phenomenal. Now, and, and didn't uh, wasn't it also the fact that with all these conversational bots, uh, they only know the language. The knowledge base is only in the, le- the domain language of that company. They know all the right terms and phrases. And often people ask for something they don't know the words for. It, but it seems like Chad GPT knows what you're talking about if you're using a different uh, uh, unfamiliar phrase, it still gets what you what you actually mean. It's more contextual, isn't that right? It, it it actually depends, I think, on 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 the solution that you're looking at. I think one of the big challenges that we've seen, just in general, with people building out their own internal enterprise bots, is that they're they're starting from scratch. And when you start from scratch and you're loading in knowledge articles or you're building your own knowledge, you know, your own language model, it's just based on the information that you know or based on how you interact or the company interacts. But back to your earlier point, the way employees ask questions can can, can vary greatly uh, across multiple different organizations or even within an organization. As people are coming in from the outside, they have a different way of referring to things. And that has created a lot of challenges. So the way that we've actually been looking at at, at this particular conversational AI, AI space is not to look, not to go deep inside an organization and say, well, you know, every organization is going to go build their own thing. That doesn't scale because what we actually found, Dion, is is that it doesn't really matter if you work for Nike, you work for Caterpillar or you work for Kaiser Permanente. Over 87 percent of what employees ask is essentially the same thing across every organization. Now, they do have their own individual uh, acronyms, of course. Every company has its own buzzwords and, you know, and lingo. But what we actually found is that the right way to build these conversational uh, AI platforms is not by having somebody go deep and build it themselves, but really how can you start learning from, from the collective? And so if you look at what ChatGPT did and what they did really well is they basically learned from what was commonly on the internet. Hmm. So they could actually look at all of that content. But what we're seeing now within the enterprise is very much the same thing. How can I actually adopt a virtual agent that I don't have to go and train because I don't have <laughs> I don't have the resources. I don't have computational linguists sitting in my boiler room, just sitting there waiting to build a language model. So so if if I'm, if I'm looking at a, at a at an environment where the majority of the of what people are asking anyways is common across every company, let's leverage something that's already been pre-trained to understand the employee language. Now, one of the things that we're also seeing with a lot of these LLMs is certainly ChatGPT is this humongous LLM that understands everything from recipes to you know plane tickets, mm-hmm. you name it. But but it's not really required to go something quite that broad when you're going inside the enterprise. There are now some LLMs that are really focused specifically on one, on one ontology, such as the language of employees. And that's, you know, that's, I think as organizations are looking at what do I need to adopt for my particular world? I think that's where they're going to be heading in is really looking at how can I use a subset of it or an LLM that is really focused specifically on the world that I care about. Yeah, Pat, we had the head of conversational AI and advanced assistant from Google on our show a couple of weeks ago. And he talked about, you know, the work that's happening there at Google and, you know, in terms of the readiness of using generative AI in the enterprise at scale and, 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 and uh, understanding and optimizing uh, foundational models. And, you know, uh, gave us a sense that, you know, there's a readiness uh, and process that needs to be uh, uh, that enterprises need to go through in order to feel comfortable in terms of the accuracy, relevancy, making sure you're not drifting from your brand promise. Now, you talk about frictionless self-help. You have incredible stats on your website about customers gaining efficiencies and getting to the answers quickly. Um, and you want to bring this consumer experience. Like, you know, I have a bunch of Alexas in my house and I've got three digital natives, my children, and they're just talking about weather, tickets to concerts, uh, you know, what to watch on, uh, you know, our 10 different streaming services we have in our house. So 
Talk to us about bringing that frictionless, conversational, very easy experience to the enterprise uh, uh, and, and how you're planning to perhaps use crowdsource models to achieve this incredible magic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, when I'm, I, I can't say the A word here because, uh, because <laughs> I'm on virtual agent is actually going to cause everybody's, uh, everybody's rooms to start lighting up. But when I ask, when I ask Amazon's virtual agent in my own home to open the front door, yeah. it's not telling me, Oh, okay. Why don't you walk to the front door, unlock the door, turn the knob, open door. It unlocks the door for me. And the fact that it's taking action is really the key, the key here. What we've actually been seeing, and one of the reasons why our statistics are so high in terms of resolution rates, is not because we're providing a better set of responses to employees, because employees, frankly, don't really want to be reading instructions, right? Here are 10 things that you could do to go reset your password. No, they don't want any of that. What they want is they want these virtual agents to take action on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So if I need access to a piece of software, they're expecting, they're expecting the bot to go and take care of that. They're not expecting the bot to come back and say, well, here's an email address that you can send an email to, or here's a form that you can go fill out. They just want the thing to take, get taken care of. Yeah, and they, want, they want the outcome, right? They want the outcome. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They want the outcome. And it, it, I think it, that has been one of the key things that we've learned over the past you know, five, six years is that to be successful and to really drive the highest deflection rates, first and foremost, focus on automation first. Once you can automate work, great. For us, providing a generative response is sort of a second-class citizen, right? There are cases where you have to do that. If somebody asked, for instance, where do I find PPE equipment? Well, there's no automation for that. You know, PPE happens to be in the closet on the right-hand side in building two or whatever. That you do have to provide a response. Now, you did you did raise something else around kind of the the challenges around generative AI and generative responses and and so on. What we've actually been hearing from our customers is they love the concept. However, for them, they want to make sure that whatever LLM they're using or virtual agent they're using, even if it's integrated inside either a public or a private LLM, is yeah. that it's always focusing first and foremost on corporate content. So if there is content somewhere in the organization that actually talks about how to roll over a 401k, for instance, they want to make sure that that's what's provided versus something that is that has been trained off, you know, a million different websites on the Internet that's going to end up creating some form of response that is inconsistent with the way that that organization works. The, the interesting part about generative AI for our customers is that what they want to do is they want to be able to use their content and rephrase the content in a way that lay people can understand. Because what we've actually seen is some of these documents, particularly in the world of IT and sometimes in finance, is that they were those documents were really created primarily for the internal people, the people on the service desk or people in IT, the experts, right. if you will. Right. And that's something that Marion Finance simply cannot understand. So can you use generative AI to take those complex co documents and then I hate to say dumb and down, but dumb it down, right? Yeah. So that lay people can understand it. And that's where a lot of the value really comes in is being able to leverage your content and generative, generative AI and really get the best of both worlds. Well, and, and this is what ChatGPT and, and other LLMs or, or um, uh, powered bots are good at is you can say, explain you know, to me like I'm five years old. Right. Exactly. It will. It will say, okay. I, it will scrub all uh, difficult terminology from there and, and you know, it really works. But so, Pat, I was wondering if you could really unpack for us the, the, the actual act of doing this, because I'm hearing more and more about how we're going to be using generative AI and actually getting it to do things for us, not just talk back to us. And you meant you talked about actually resolving these issues, uh, and that has a variety of implications. So how can enterprises best channel all of this in a way that's very effective? Because I'm talking to product CTOs, uh, they're finding that all, not only their knowledge base has been scraped, but Every support forum that's ever talked about that product has been scraped. Um, every, you know, Quora and um, Stack Exchange, anything that's ever mentioned their product, it, it's ingested it all. So it has this great wealth of knowledge, uh, but some of it is also old or outdated. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the second part of the question, so, how, you know, how do you, how do you make that actually work? How do you train up an, a, an NLP and an and AI to work? But how do you keep it safe? Because it strikes me as when, you, when you're handing over control of your IT systems and resetting passwords and everything to the AI, um, you have to be really careful that you're doing things that are safe 
Uh, they can't be misused as though someone will figure out an exploit, you know, for that. So how do you, how do you, how do enterprises actually do this? Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of questions in there. <laughs> you have to go, you know, one by one, but I think that one of the key pieces that you just touched on is really around security. So let's first mm -hmm. start with security. What our, what, what, what I'm actually seeing with our customers is that they're not necessarily looking to connect our virtual agent to, um, to open AI. What they're looking to do is they're really looking to connect to either we have our own LLM, connect to our LLM. Maybe they have their own private LLM connected to that. Mm -hmm. But what they do not want, what they're really worried about is, for instance, what was, you know, was disclosed last week with Samsung. Somebody just you know, provided something to open AI. Now it's just part of some, some, you know, some potentially some future generated response. The problem here is a lot of CIOs, I was at a CIO event last week and this came up all the time. What they were telling me is their CEOs are asking the CIOs, why are we not using open AI? Well, CIOs actually recognize the security challenges here. Mm -hmm. So what we've actually done with our particular platform, not, 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 you know, not, not to, to talk too much product, but what we've been able to help our customers with is to basically validate what somebody is asking before we send it to an LLM, particularly if it's a public LLM. We want to make sure that we're minimizing or eliminating the opportunity for confidential PII, PHI, source code, mm -hmm. anything yeah. like that to actually be sent to OpenAI or BARD or some other public LLM that could now be used in the future for training purposes. And this is particularly dangerous because you can imagine somebody in legal who's basically sending up documents and saying, hey, you know, can you help me redline this document? And now all of a sudden, somebody in the future is going to ask, who are potential acquirers for a company? And sure enough, it came from that document that, you know, that was submitted. This is why there's a lot of concern around just disclosing information. And here's an interesting statistic. 43% of professional workers are using ChatGPT today. 68% of those, their managers don't know they're using it. Here's the problem, right? And so all this data could be going. So what our customers are now doing is saying, hey, I want to be able to control access to LLMs, GPT, and I wanted this to go through our corporate virtual agent. So they have a corporate virtual agent strategy. And that corporate, that virtual agent will go to the LLM after doing some form of cleansing, if you will, make sure that nothing's being sent that is inappropriate. That's amazing stats. I mean, you know, five days to get to a million, 60 days to get to 100 million. I don't think there's anything that's had the, uh, the, the accelerated adoption of generative AI that we experienced in November of last year. Um, OK, so you're advising CEOs of enterprise. Uh, how do you what do you tell them in terms of, uh, you know, giving space for their employees to adopt some of these new technologies? Sadly, as you just said, seven out of 10 are using it and the bosses don't know. How do you give them the space to do this, but at the same time ensure there's a level of productivity or increased productivity that comes with uh, learning these new prompt engineering skills and use of these new emerging tech? Yeah. Well, what we're seeing is organizations are now starting to shut down direct access to some of these tools, and they're simply mm -hmm. telling their employees, you know, you can access these tools by going through some form of a virtual agent or something. Think This is almost like firewalls all over again. This is a chat GPT firewall, essentially, right? Yeah. So they're trying to shut, not shut things down, but at least control it so that they have visibility into who's asking what. Another interesting question is organizations are now starting to provide LLM, you know, support to their employees, or either in a public LLM or a private LLM is, is just the cost. I mean, this here's a huge yeah. variable. Nobody really knows who's asking <laughs> what. I could be going in there and asking it to write a book for me, and my employer is paying for that. But you know, so they have no visibility. They don't have no control whatsoever. So there's there's a security concern, but there's also a cost concern. And so a lot of this is causing organizations to say, okay, I want to I want to be able to provide the productivity benefits of an LLM to my employees, but I want to make sure that I'm doing this in a safe and responsible way. That's great. That's great feedback. Uh, Pat, thank you so much uh, for, you know, expanding our minds and the importance of these new technologies and its impact into enterprise. Uh, greatly appreciate you being on Disrupt TV. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. It's great to have CEOs understand the impact and also share their experiences because this is new tool for all of us, you know, and, uh, and to be able to not ignore uh, these technologies, I think is important. Okay, 
Our next guest, uh, we are delighted to have Eduardo Camacho, Senior Vice President, Customer Success and Chief Customer Officer. Oh, I missed that title. I used to be a <laughs> Chief Customer Officer at BMC. Uh, BMC works with 86% of uh, Forbes Global 50 uh, customers and partners around the world to create their future. And for Dion, for nine consecutive years, Gartner has positioned BMC in their magic quadrant for IT service management tools. Amazing oh, accomplishment. I, I I'm an old IT guy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, old you would know. BMC. You would know. Uh, Eduardo is responsible for cohesive and impactful customer success function that helps BMC customers on their journey to an autonomous digital enterprise. I love that. Autonomous digital enterprise. Uh, Eduardo also serves as chief customer uh, advocate uh, or the voice of the customer focused on developing and implementing a value-driven customer success program that champions customers and keeps them in the center of what all of what BMC uh, achieves. An accomplished customer uh, success executive, Eduardo has over 25 years, she must have started when she was 10, 25 years of leadership experience uh, with the pre-sales partner, professional services, customer success organization, as an executive vice president with global responsibilities. Welcome, Eduardo, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you. So, Eduardo, um... You know, we're living in an interesting time where, you know, instantaneous gratification is now the expectation and it's often not met, you know, uh, and this is not just in consumer technology. This is enterprise now. Gen Z is arriving in the workforce. Um, they have expectations that they, you know, the whole experience should be like TikTok and, and all these incredibly easy to use tools where you can just sponge information. You can be in a information sponge. Um, and so walk us through what are the expectations today about great customer service? Um, you know, how is the latest technology, things like ChatGPT we just talked about, uh, resetting expectations? What are you seeing with your customers, Eduardo? Yeah, it's really an interesting, especially for a company like BMC, right? That's been uh, around for, for a long time to see this transition. I know we call it the Amazonification uh, effort, if you want, right? <laughs> you know, we are all living in the world of being consumers. Everything used to be uh, instantaneous for like access to data, to product, to service. We have immediate receipts. We can give it back. We only pay for what we consume. So it's all built around, right, this ease, ease of uh, usage for us, for the consumer ability to serve. I think what's interesting is like we all bring this to our workplace, right? So our customers, even if they're top financial institutions in the world or uh, insurances or telcos or the most regulated type of industries you can think of, you know, there are people that work there, even if the ones that work, you know, in what we thought was the old mainframe environments, they bring the expectations from the consumer world, right? We all bring the expectations to our business. We want, you know, the instantaneous access. We want the, you know, consuming in all types of forms. Um, so what's interesting is, you know, I'm living through that now in, in BMC, but also in my previous experiences is it's much more complex to do that, right? In the world of um, business to business and complex enterprise software. You know, the data complexity, the organizational setup, the silos, the products are more, much more complex and interwined. But we need to really think about how to kind of shield, right, all of the consumers at our customers from the process-centric heavy approaches from the past that were here to protect us and to be more operational efficiency. Mm -hmm. And really think about, you know, how can we have safe and reliant self-service and that concept of instant access uh, as we interact with our customers, independently of how regulated they are themselves. So I think it's a really interesting change that is, you know, it's forcing a change at everything we do um, as a company and, and you know, at our customers and everyone else in the industry, for sure. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, when you visit the, the BMC website, uh, you see the phrase, um, we're driven by customer success, very prominently right at the website. So, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you recruit and retain uh, the right talent and personnel uh, so that you can ensure 
customers are, are successful and that customers are continuing to innovate. What's the secret sauce? Because when you go to your website, you also see like awards for best product, best place to work, best business partner. You guys are doing a lot of things right. How do you bring the right talent into BMC? Yeah, it, um, I think we, we've a lot of it, you know, I call it a bit of a balanced approach. And I think it's this great combination of, you know, you have to rely on, you know, developing uh, your in-house talent and acquire new talent that obviously has all the skills of the newer generations, right? You know, digital uh, first, tech savvy. Um, but you have to have that combined with uh, a capacity for empath empathy, right? You mm -hmm. know, I, I use yes. that word again and again and again. If you don't have the empathy and all you have is the digital savviness, you're going to create this cold digital experiences as us as individual consumers or customers of an enterprise software company or of a consumer company. No one wants that, right? You want a the opposite, a warm digital experience that you feel there's a human with common sense behind it, right? You know, it's augmenting the digital with the human touch. So when we think about talent and how we think about our talent strategy, you know, we think about those two areas, you know, can the talent be empathetic while being able to always think digital and translation, uh, you know, the knowledge they have into something that you can put a self-service in the hands of your customers. Right. I think the second is communication, communication skills. Like, uh, I know you were very generous about, you know, when you think I started my career, but I learned <laughs> a certain way, right? In terms of how you communicate and the formality of how you communicate and formal usage of tools. And the reality today is like the combination of formal, informal, communicate social media on a call, mm -hmm. uh, communicate person to person, be able to flip through all of that, you know, be able to leverage all diverse ways, you know, all the way from Twitter to a community post, to do a little short YouTube video, to, you know, uh, create content that is useful for putting an in-app for, you know, learning. Uh, that's something else, obviously, that we look for in the talent is that capacity to float among all those, those different types of situation. No one wants somebody that cannot hold their ground, you know, talking to a customer in a live format. Right. But also no one wants somebody that can only do that and then, you know, is incapable of, um, you know, living in the digital, uh, in the digital world, in the social media world, or just doesn't feel comfortable with that. So those are some of the areas. But I think a lot of it is really ingraining in your workforce, hmm. the concept of, you know, the empathy towards the customer, how, you, what you do, how you communicate, your sense of service. It's key, you know, not just your technical and digital ability, if you want to call it like that. Obviously, you know, all of this part of this disrupted, right, with artificial intelligence, large language models, all of the current buzz, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I love the communication and empathy. I agree with you 100%. Go ahead, Daya. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting. So you said the word empathy a number of times, and I think that's you know th that's the ethos that that great customer experience really has to have. Um, and I've seen that you know a, a lot of uh, tech te technology companies that have that empathy deep in what they're doing. There are people often do the right thing about customer experience, but mm -hmm. we also see that uh, the practice involves a lot of measurement, a lot of analytics, a lot of understanding yes. the data, a lot of putting all of your data about that customer in the to the service of that customer. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what silo it's in. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how to how to make customer experience more data driven. How do you use data to transform customer mm -hmm. experience uh, once you have the empathy piece down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I think part of the uh, of the effort there that we do, um, and we've been pretty focused around evolving that, uh, you know, in a data and uh, IT company like BMC, you know, like, Obviously, there's the piece about collecting and analyzing, you know, the thousands of data points, navigating through the noise, getting the actionable insights, you know, make sure that it's not just the loudest piece of data that you're actually, you know, making good judgment and good tools to decide on um, and prioritize uh, what is important, what's the real actionable outcome out of all the stuff that you collect. But then it's equally important, and that's a lot of what we are really focusing on in the last few months is 
how do you democratize that data? How do you put that data in the hands of the enterprise using you know, appropriate, trusted, safe, secure channels to really allow you know, the people that really run the business in their different areas of expertise to take the right decisions? Um, I think voice of the customer is a great example of that, right? You know, it's it's such a valuable information. It's such a valuable data. And you kind of have so many insights derived out of that. But if you if you keep it to the, you know, the silo of uh, an analytics team or you keep it within the customer experience team, right? You're not really leveraging that power to really transform an experience. So it's equally important, you know, all the mechanisms and the technology and the analytics capability you use to make sense out of that data and prioritize as it is how you put it in the hands of your organization and you empower, you know, the, uh, the different teams to make the right decisions. Uh, do you need to change the way you're engaging in a certain uh, sales uh, engagement model? Do you need to change the way you're invoicing your customers? All of that. You know, if you put the right data in the hands of the right business functions, they can make the decisions. That's much better than trying to have a small centralized team, right? Decide what's a priority. Um, so I think that's one of the ways, right? The, the data is there, it's available. You can drive a lot of programmatic actions out of it to improve customer experience, but you really make the difference when you're able to leverage and democratize that across the organization so the people immediately that are engaging can take the right decisions that's great advice I, you know i uh, i i reflect uh, my time being a chief customer officer from a uh, you know boston based company called interesis networks and i spent a lot of my time reminding my peers chief information chief revenue chief mm -hmm. marketing uh, chief information that customer service is not a department for us to achieve good net promoter score, good CSAT, good lifetime value of a customer. We have to have a team approach, but uh, that meant sharing data across lines of business. I went to IDC directions a month ago and Crawford, uh, pre president of IDC in Boston, shared during his keynote that only 12% of businesses share customer data across departments. That's a really low number. So in terms of like uh, a team approach of improving customer experience, if nine out of 10 businesses are not collaborating with data, they're going to have, like you mentioned several times, silos. And silos not only kill careers, but they kill companies, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. give us a sense of your a day in the life of a chief customer officer. How much time is required to ensure that sales, service, marketing, IT, HR have a common view of the customer and they can make the right course corrections to improve the experience? Hmm. Well, let me, uh, you know, maybe uh, as you were talking, uh, it triggered in my mind, you know, when I, when I joined BMC maybe 19 months ago, uh, my CEO and I, we had the discussion, right? You know, expectations of my role. And we basically said there's like, three areas that you know we i divide my time with one obviously running a customer success organization which is a yes. sizable organization right yes. two being the voice of our customers so engaging with our customers you know be their chief advocate making sure they're well represented they're happy you know we have strategic alignment moving forward and the third which really means i spend a third of my time there is evangelizing all of that inside the company and making sure everyone from recruiting to um, uh, account, you know accounting to uh, marketing to sales to product r d everyone really understands both the data the voice of our customers and the role they play and a lot of it it's not even magic right it's kind of letting the data speak for itself you know shining a light on this sure. is what the customers are really doing this is what they're really saying this is what it really means oh we think we have a problem here well let me show you a pattern a pattern of usage a pattern of data so it's bringing i think it's two things right is always pivoting the conversations that you're on all the time to always put it in customer language and customer 
uh, focus, right? You know, we are talking about something. What does it matter for a customer, right? How is it going to impact? Like right, making sure right. everyone is thinking like that. But also bringing the value, right? If you're talking to sales and you've been a CCO, you know that, and you tell them, look, here's a pattern of customers. Here's the cohort of customers that I've seen this, right? And this is what they're saying. It means, you know, we could go and do a campaign to go upsell them something else that is going to be very valuable. Right. You're talking to an R&D leader and say, you're not complaining about, you know, the 10, uh, you know, random bugs that somebody filled, uh, you know, uh, a ticket on. But you're saying, look, you know, I've spoken with these 20 customers. We have gathered health scores from hundreds of customers. Here's the three priorities yeah. that we need to work together. When you start doing that all the time and across all the life cycle of the customer, you know, step by step, you really get the customer and the customer journey to rule versus, you know, the functions to rule in terms right. of how we think about the business, right? Yep. So that's been my experience, you know, uh, customer data and customer experience data is just one of those tools, right? But sure. There's so many more. So that's Diana, nice. Diana, do you, Diana, do you agree with me? Uh, Eduardo has the most important job at BMC. Oh, no question about it. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> that is such an awesome set of responsibilities. Man, I miss being in your shoe. Well, kind of, <laughs> sort of, because as much as it's important, it is hard work. Yep. It really is. Anyway, 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 but that's that's some other time. You're reminding <laughs> me what I why I love my job. There that's you right, and it, it, you absolutely <laughs> look like you love your job. Go ahead, Daya. Yeah. So, uh, Eduardo, uh, you know, BMC has been around a long time. It really had staying power in the industry. I've taken countless briefings from startup competitors who thought they had a better idea. Um, <laughs> but you and the guys are still standing, um, and you know, become a real stalwart in the industry. Uh, but you got to keep innovating. You have to, you know, we see the landscape changing in real time today, faster than I've, I've ever seen it in my entire career. Um, and, you know, it was the old saying, you know, if I ask my customers what the, uh, what they want, you know, the, the Henry Ford question, you know, they'll say, I want faster cars when they actually need, probably need something that they don't know how to ask for. How are you, mm -hmm. what, what do like customer success teams need now? What are you guys looking at, uh, given your bird's eye view? Yeah, well, really what we are investing on you know, now from a, a customer success overall perspective, uh, apart from, again, making sure we have the right talent and the right, you know, uh, digital complementing human, right? You know, again, digital first is not humanless approaches, mm -hmm. obviously focusing a lot on that. The, the given the empathy type, right? And the right talent and really uh, the focus on on uh, the automation, I think, you know, uh, large language models, what are you going to do with that to really complement uh, what we are doing from a human perspective, making it easier uh, for our customers to work with us, all of those things, right? Again, we have, it's interesting because, you know, you were talking about, you know, what you see when you get into the BMC webpage, right? And it's all about how we help our customers become digital businesses and, and leverage the power of technology to have better customer experience, to have better actionable insights, to have better business agility. Guess what? We are using all of that and using it with ourselves, leveraging all of our, you know, potential around, you know, doing uh, digital customer experience and self-service. And, you know, we just launched, uh, you know, new uh, products, you know, leveraging, uh, you know, Helix uh, GPT and a bunch of other innovations really focusing around uh, data, data pipeline, data orchestration, automation. So one way of addressing that is we are basically using all of our approach of how we help companies reinvent, right, to become, uh, again, digital businesses from the IT infrastructure, from the what we call digital connected operations. We are using it to ourselves, which makes it, it, we are like customer zero, if you want to call it like that, yeah, yeah, right. or our own thing, right? So right. it's an awesome thing to do. We have this amazing IT department, you know, with our customer success department, with our product department, and we think about ourselves as customer zero of everything, you know, we promise to our customers. And it's a pretty interesting self-feeding mechanism, right? About learning what works, what doesn't, where we can add value. Um, so that is a big, a major focus making sure the human part doesn't get relegated, which is always going to be a big piece of what I push, right? 
I love that. Customers drinking your own champagne. I love that. Customer zero. That's, That's what we're doing. Exactly. That is great advice for all business leaders. You absolutely need to make sure that whatever you're delivering to your external paying customers, you know, uh, meets the promise that, that, that you share. It's, uh, it's a privilege to have Eduardo Camacho, Chief Customer Officer at BMC with us. Thank you so much for your shared wisdom. That was terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Wow, that's uh, yeah. it's not an easy job. Anybody who thinks uh, CCO is an easy job, they need to it do it for a all week. The happy <laughs> yeah, time. yeah. I used to be tall and handsome until I became CCO, and then yeah, it, it's hard work. <laughs> okay, this is uh, if you're a baseball fan, this is our cleanup hitter spot where an amazing guest comes and hits a grand slam and brings it all home. It's our privilege to have Sheena Ian uh, Gar, uh, author of Think Bigger. How to Innovate. <laughs> Sheena is a ST Lee Professor of Business at the Columbia Business School. She's one of the world's experts on choice and innovation. Sheena's book, The Art of Choosing, was ranked by the Financial Times, McKinsey, and Amazon as one of the best business books of the year. Sheena's, uh, Dino, listen to this. Sheena's TED Talks have received over 7 million views. Awesome. I, don't, I don't think I've had 70,000 views of anything I've done. This is amazing. Sheena's reg Sheena regularly appears in top tier media, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New Yorker, CNBC, CNN, and every uh, major media outlet that you can imagine. The Asian American Business Development Center ranked Sheena as one of the 2022's outstanding 50 Asian Americans in business. Sheena also regularly appears on the Thinkers 50 list of the most influential business thinkers. Sheena's new book, which we're going to be talking about, was released last week, last week, April 11th, is Think Bigger, How to Innovate. And in Think Bigger, you know, you, you answered this timeless question of how can I get best my best ideas? You can follow Sheena on Twitter at Sheena, S-H-E-E-N-A underscore I Y E N G A R. Welcome, Sheena, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. Thank you for such a warm introduction. Thank you. Yeah, You're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you. Sheena, um, you know, you, you, you've got your new book, and congratulations. I, I, I know what that's like getting those out. That's uh, it, it's such a relief, but, and then now you can really <laughs> enjoy it. Um, so, innovation is is the name of the game uh, in the modern economy. It's the, the ability to Absolutely. change, and transform, and um, yeah, and that's what you've been talking about in the last two uh, guests you had. It's all yeah. about innovation. It really yeah, is. Innovator guy. Uh, and so we're all, we, we have all of these um, innovation activities. We've got, uh, and we, we do retreats and we take uh, senior executives and we attempt to deliberately come up with the next this, big this idea, the, the, next, the next plan. Um, but is that maybe the right approach? What is the downside of doing brainstorming like that? Uh, uh, walk us through your thoughts and, and how you're thinking about uh, the innovation. Do you know when brainstorming was first invented? Uh, oh, wow. No. 1938. Wow. Now, so it's in the 20th century it was invented. It was invented in 1938, and despite all the talk we have about innovation and how important it is, we haven't actually innovated on the process of innovation since 1938. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And do you know why brainstorming was invented? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was invented, actually, since you were just talking to somebody who's a customer service expert, it was actually invented by the head of BBDO, the biggest advertising agency at the time. So brainstorming was invented in New York City, even though it's associated with uh, IDEO in the Silicon Valley. So it was invented by uh, the this guy that was the head of BBDO, Alex Osborne. And he was trying to solve a very simple problem back then. His problem was when I speak, everybody just nods their head and says yes. How do I get people to actually talk and share what they know? So he came up with these five very simple rules. Defer judgment, don't interrupt each other, build on each other's ideas, go for wild ideas. Wonderful set of instructions to have a more, you know, enriched, lively conversation so that you're not talking to yourself. And brainstorming accomplishes all of that. 
Brainstorming also makes sure that if you have five different people in the room and they all have different relevant bits of information, it's a great way if they're willing to share the information to coordinate so that you can actually, you know, get the coordination system working. It actually worked very well during World War II when, you know, the Navy and the Air Force and, and the manufacturing were all talking to each other for once. What brainstorming doesn't do is help you come up with new meaningful ideas. Hmm. And it wasn't designed to do that. Yeah, it sounds like what you're describing is more of a consensus uh, approach to let, let's only build on top of each other's ideas instead of coming up with something brand new. Is, is, am I saying that right? Well, it's building on one of the rules of improvisation. And sure, let's say you say dog, I say cat, and the next person says rat. So you will be saying something slightly different, but you set the anchor. You got us all thinking about amp, uh, got, got us all thinking about animals. So if you mm. actually want people to have, to bring different ideas to the table, you need them to actually be allowed to bring different knowledge to the table. That makes sense. Uh, before I ask my uh, official question, I'm wondering, do you still put sugar in Japanese tea? <laughs> I. You know, it's funny. I don't. I know. No! I'm oh! finally grown up and I'm an adult now, and I actually don't put sugar in any tea. Now, the relevant question is how much sugar do I put in my cup of coffee in the morning? <laughs> that is... And there I do put two and a half spoons of sugar in my cup of coffee, and that is the most important drink of my day. Awesome. For those of you who may not know, the 7 million TED Talk I referenced in the <laughs> intro, you you got to watch because uh, you immediately fall in love with uh, Sheena's ability to tell incredible stories. Okay. What is a third eye test and how do you use a third eye test to find out uh, creative steps that's happening in, in, in your mind? Okay. I want you to close your eyes. Okay. Like really close your eyes. I'm blind, but you know, I'm going to trust that you're going to close your eyes. It's closed. <laughs> and I want you to now imagine a dog wearing pants. Okay. Just picture it in your head, a dog wearing pants. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So now okay. I'm going to first tell you what I imagine. I imagine a yellow Labrador retriever wearing uh, white pants on his two back legs. Okay. What did you imagine? I had a German Shepherd with uh, blue jeans on. Okay. I had a golden retriever, blue jeans, back legs. Okay. Yeah, Did you notice how much variation there was? I gave you very simple instructions. Imagine a dog wearing pants and notice how we all had different images in our head. Wow. The more I'm able to understand the way you're going to see the idea I have in my head, and the more I'm able to create alignment so that you're seeing what I see, that actually is an important part of the ideation process. And we often take that for granted. So that's what the third eye is, helping me see what you're going to see when I describe my idea. And in the process of learning what you see, I learn relevant bits of information that help me edit my idea. So you just gave me an idea. It doesn't have to be white, it could be blue. Doesn't have to be a Labrador retriever. It could be a German Shepherd. That was yeah, awesome. I've interviewed a thousand people on this show. I've never closed my eyes and imagined, and then immediately saw the relevance in the exercise. That was cool. That was very yeah. cool. Go ahead, Diane. I'll have to do more of those. Uh, <laughs> so, so Sheena, um, so you know, how can we boil this down to something actionable that people can actually use? Uh, and, and, and improve the way that they innovate and, and brainstorm. Uh, what do you see are the three essential creative tools for innovation and how do you maximize their, the potential of each one of those? So the Think Bigger method, which I've been developing for the last 10 years, um, it has six steps to it and essentially three tools. But what I'm going to do is, since you've asked me to break it down into three major conceptual points, I'm going to give you the three, con three major concepts. So the first would be break down the problem. Right? We, we all know the big problem. I, I need more growth. 
I need to make sure I'm not left behind because of this new weirdo thing called chat GBT that now 63% of people are apparently using with my, without my knowledge. Okay. So you can define the big problem usually, but what we're really bad at is in figuring out how to break it down into its subparts and into its most meaningful subparts, right? And as a result, we either try to solve the really big problem that's often rather vague and unwieldy, or we start solving for something that we think is more solvable, but it's usually the less relevant piece. So really being able to say, now, what are the most important reasons why this problem is a challenge for me? And coming up with those three to five most important parts of my problem that need to be solved for. So that's the first thing I would say that's really important to innovation. I guarantee you that many times simply breaking down your problem will make it easier for you to see what solution already exists that you just couldn't see before. Yeah, yeah. taking the taking those pieces and the pieces can really help. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, whenever you're overwhelmed, just breaking it down in many ways shows you what to do. Okay. The second is what I call searching in and out of the box. We've all heard the imperative, think out of the box, but has anyone ever told you how to think out of the box? <laughs> no, no, no. Right? And in Think Bigger, what we tell you to do is in order to think out of the box, you literally go to other boxes, right? So if I want to understand how people are going to respond to chat GBT, before I get paranoid about it, I should actually go see how did people respond to other totally different technologies that have happened in the present, but also in the past, you know, like in response to the car, in response to the camera, in response to, you know, I mean, the internet. Um, there's lots of different technologies that have caused us massive amounts of dist distress and disruption. Mm -hmm. Who were the winners and losers? How did they what did they do to succeed? So it's, I, it's saying, I have a problem. I don't know the solution. My industry doesn't have the solution right now. What other industry in the present or in the past had to solve for an analogous problem, hmm. solve for it successfully, what did they do? Now, Obviously, whatever solution they did will not be, uh, you know, you can't just try import it in exactly into your world because they solved it for their problem. So you take their solution, you edit it, you adapt it for use in your world. So that's the second most important tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for all of these things, I have different exercises and techniques for doing it. Um, and the third is choice mapping which is essentially creative combination. So we know that no matter what innovation you take up, whether it be from the present or in the past, right? Whether it was the development of chat GPT, whether it was Netflix, whether it was the car, whether it was ice cream, whether it was the printing press, they were all combinations of existing ideas at the time at which they were created. Mm -hmm. And so how did they do that? They took existing ideas or things that were working in their world from totally different domains, and now they combined them and kept combining them until they found a solution that worked. And that's what's also key, is that ability to just keep combining the useful pieces from different domains into something that works for you. Terrific. Yep. Well, we have a choice expert with us today. And I find that, uh, you know, for me to get to my to-do list, I have to also keep a to-don't list. Uh, so I'm pretty deliberate in terms of choosing uh, or selectively being ignorant and giving myself a pass on a lot of things so that I could uh, focus on what I think matters uh, for my company, my team, myself. Um, as you're teaching students at Columbia, do you find uh, that today they're better equipped at choosing uh, what they study, where they do their internship? Not at all. What? 
Not at all. Okay, okay. All right. All right. Tell us, what, what's distracting us uh, more so today than when you were teaching in the past? I just think we have too much information, too mm. much choice, too much access to knowledge of what other people are doing at any given moment. And so we're constantly suffering from FOMO. Wow. And that, wow. in a sense, is that, very distracting and scary. overwhelming. Yeah. And so then she, on so top she, of that, add yeah. to the fact that we don't even know what information is fake or real. Wow. So so is access to all this information around us, is, is it forcing our, 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 our students or ourselves to be more reflexive thinking where we're just trying to respond to what we're consuming versus reflective thinking where we deeply try to understand the why, the why, the what, the how? Like, what is it about our thinking process that's distracting us to I do not think make we're much better, better at being reactive. That's probably a skill our young have better than okay. the older generations have. But you're right. They're not as good at being able to... They, they don't have that downtime. They don't allow themselves that downtime. I think they feel like losers if they give themselves downtime. Yeah, well, and, and as a result, there's no time to, to make sense of all of these information and content swirling around us. Or just have the time to be able to ask yourself, what what's the most important thing I need to focus on right now? Yeah, no, exactly. My last question is, uh, uh, in, in Think Bigger, you, you append the myth that big ideas are only reserved for a select few. Um, so so I, 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 is it your experience show, shows that, you know, anyone can have, can think bigger? Absolutely. Uh, that, and that's, that's my goal is I want to teach as many different people as possible how to think bigger. Nice. That's a lot of goal. That, that's, that is a normal uh, purpose. That's great. Dion, go ahead. No, I would just, uh, you know, we are, what we're curious about is uh, what does it really take uh, to make a successful innovator today? We talked about, you know, the reactive uh, uh, you know, mode that we're all in. Uh, you know, is a singular creative genius the, the, the best way to go about it? Is it the strategic copier or cloner uh, who can, com you know, combine the, uh, and copy the best ideas into a better product? Uh, how does it work? Well, I think the myth is that they're creative geniuses, right? That, you know, hmm. the reason why Newton was who he was is because, you know, he was a special person and the apple fell on his head. And <laughs> Einstein just had a special brain, which is why we, you know, tried to study his brain and, you know, didn't want anything bad to happen to his brain even after he died. But they were both actually, if they were genius at something, it was at being strategic copiers. You know, Einstein was a patent officer and he got to know patents for all kinds of interesting things like uh, refrigeration, typewriters. He actually even made his own patent of a funky blouse, not that it was a blouse that we wanted to wear, but he, he even dabbled a bit. And, uh, and he himself said that that was his, his worldly oyster. That's where he got and hatched his best ideas. It's that ability to have access to different boxes of knowledge as we were talking earlier. And once you have access to those different boxes of knowledge, you're able to import that in and strategically copy and combine. That's amazing. We're here with Sheena Iyengar, author of a new book, Think Bigger, How to Innovate. Thank you, Sheena, for your amazing with shared wisdom. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That went by in a flash. Wow. That, Diane, is that, is that not the fastest hour of your week? Because it certainly <laughs> is the fastest hour of my week. That, that was your thoughts about, we started with the uh, impact of generative AI and enterprise. We talked about what does customer service look like in an experience led economy. And then finally, how anyone can think bigger and innovate your, 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 your thoughts about our, well, our, uh, our guests. It's all connected as Sheena noted, right? It's, you know, the customers are moving to the center of everything. Uh, innovation is how we, we move forward uh, and compete and provide value to the market. And it's all getting automated in very exciting ways so that we can focus on the strategic big ideas, the big thinking, uh, 
uh, doing a lot of things that Sheena's talking about, we, that's going to be our job. Uh, you know, a lot of the bots are going to do a lot of low level work and we're going to, we're going to be figuring out how all the pieces of the puzzle come together. Right? So I, th I think it was, we had a pretty good thread that went through this whole show. Uh, we have one of the best producers in the world, so that's no surprise. <laughs> uh, we're very deliberate about, you know, our, our guest. Is this in your experience, and again, you're one of the foremost uh, thinkers uh, and practitioners in the world of IT. Have you, have you, is this the most amount of uh, combined disruption vectors that's facing CIOs in the enterprise and frankly, all line of business leaders? Oh, it, it's unbelievable. I, everyone's uh, plans for the year have been completely upended, right? So they all did their budget budgeting cycle late last year. They all had their plans coming in. We're <laughs> going to do hybrid work uh, and we're going to, we're going to figure out how to manage costs as the economy is uncertain. And then now if you aren't investing heavily in AI, you're, you're basically irrelevant. I mean, every competitive needle can reset to zero. Every company is a beginner again. Uh, new winners are, are emerging already. And uh, it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch. So everyone is really working very hard right now. Yes, this year has, uh, has been a complete you know, uh, apple cart upset, as you said. And we're going to continue talking about disruption and the changing landscape next week on episode 320. We have Jason Lemkin, Saster founder, and he's a venture capitalist and a really... A guy who's been, uh, you know, a uh, storm chaser for many, many years looking at disruptive trends. Diraj Pandas, CEO, co-founder of DevRev, and Paulo Savagat, author of The Four Workarounds. So, again, if it's uh, Friday, it's disruptive. Thank you, Dion, for subbing in for our good friend, Ray Wong. As always, you're always amazing. Great hosting. And we, we appreciate you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next week. Cheers, everyone.